and it seems that in this time the iteration is even heavier than what they had seen in the last couple of thousand years. So definitely we're into a longer, heavier, more powerful cycle overriding on top, intertwining with this grand solar minimum. ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Well, we've been having a lot of fun this morning. We're kind of, we were skirting around everything. Everybody seems calling and talking, well, in similar stretches. Where are we today, David Devine? We've heard to this morning, we talked a little bit about weather modification, uh, persistent contrails, what do they actually do, the attack on our food supply. David talks about the grand solar minimum. The fact is that we just marched into the age of Aquarius. Are they both connected? You know, astrologically, but, but I don't know if we want to get into that discussion too. Because I want to just say that let's just start it off as saying that we are in this thing called the grand solar minimum and that changes to our planet are happening constantly and they've been happening. How long will they continue and how much they will continue and what it will look like? That's kind of what I'd like to explore while we've got a few minutes. Any thoughts, David? I would certainly like to run with that and dovetail right into your last caller, Frank, there about immigration with the food shortages, with NASA coming out talking about the 200-year low in solar activity that was just released. Now, NASA came out, and they were talking about it's a great time for astronauts to be flying because there would be less galactic cosmic rays or less cosmic rays out there for these uh, astronauts to be affected by. But at the same time, in a byline about a third of the way down the article, They say, oh, the sun is going to the lowest activity state in 200 years. Well, for you and I who understand history and cycles and what that means for our societies, it means that we're going to be growing less food. Now, how does that dovetail into immigration, might you ask? And if I could explain North Africa, because that's best what I know about the immigration policies heading up to Europe and how they're trying to move back and refurbish what were the Roman grain growing areas in northern Africa as this 2000 year rain cycle returns to the uh, countries of Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria and that area there as well as over in Israel and Jordan. It seems like a lot of times when I'm watching you know Qatar or you know Abu Dhabi or somewhere it's raining over there. It's, it looks like it's wetter over there than it is over here almost. Yeah, in some instances they're getting a full year worth of rain in a day And it's become so much now, and there's so much persistent precipitation that's come in this new cycle. I firmly believe it's a a once-in-a-2,000-year cycle. Some are saying heavier, some are saying lighter. But as this persistent rainfall starts, we're starting to see the deserts around the world bloom. I mean, specifically in Afghanistan, over to Iran, we have Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, all in bloom in the deserts. And it's creating the biggest locust swarms that they've seen in and over 100 years as well, because there's just so much extra grass for these locusts to feed on. So they go hand in hand with the locust outbreaks and swarms now, along with massive, the biggest floods they've ever seen. Uh, and this predates even the uh, Silk Road traders. So one point I really want to stretch out there, and please understand if you're listening, this is the one thing I wish you could try to disprove, and I hope you do. The floods in Iran that have occurred over these last seven months They have never been recorded at this level of precipitation, water depths, river overflows, etc. Even going back to the Silk Road trading days when the Arab traders were on the Silk Road 
They never even wrote of how much rain there is occurring now. So we're talking, again, multimillennial cycles repeating here. And it seems that in this time, the iteration is even heavier than what they had seen in the last couple of thousand years. So definitely we're into a longer, heavier, more powerful cycle overriding on top, intertwining with this grand solar minimum. And speaking of cycles, my new book with my co-author Bill Porter, Climate Revolution, a must-read for understanding our sun-driven climate. As we progress deeper into this new Eddy Grand Solar Minimum, weather extremes leading to global food scarcity and higher food prices are here now. This book describes the expected changes, how to survive and thrive during future challenging times, and also practical preparations. The entire book is interactive with over 250 links. You can click and go out to the scientific aspect of what we're talking about with the repeating cycles in this grand solar minimum. The science is explained so you understand the mechanisms. The solutions are there because we know we're going to face these exact same problems again that were faced in the Maunder minimum, the Sporer minimum, the Wolf minimum. Find designs for building greenhouses, grow guides, Beam soil techniques as well as bioreactors to create your own growth hormones for the soil. Available now, the new ADAPT 2030 Climate Revolution. The link's in the description box below. You know, I don't know what kind of weather changes that is going on in Iran. That's curious that they're having the, the, a lot of rain and this and that. I know Texas, I, don't, I have a minimal scope of uh, the weather around me here in Texas. But people are all telling me that it's odd, the, the weather that we've been going through and we've been getting rain late in the season. It, weather changes, right? In a grand solar minimum, like we're entering into, I guess this is a big guess, and I have my own guess, right? Would, would the world look like as the sun stops heating the earth, what, one, two degrees? Are they going to be going into global cooling? You know, is that what we're doing? Because um, all of a sudden, how is that going to change everything? And then you were talking about the amount of sunlight that's out there. What kind of impact will that do? Because it's 10% reduction, 100% reduction. You know, is the Midwest going to be frozen over? You know, is the, the northern states, the Canadians are going to be in an iceberg? I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I'll start with the Canadians being in an iceberg. It's going to become to the point where they're not going to be able to grow crops up there in about three years from now, where they're going to have significant, I mean absolutely significant reductions where it's going to affect the global supply. Just in Canada, and we're starting to see that already in some areas, northern China and Heilongjiang this year. Also look at what's happening with North Korea as well. Uh, they're unable to grow crops this year due to drought and cold. But this is part of the population migration. And those of you who are fans of history, the future is a history book. And I keep saying that again and again. All you have to do is really look back in history at the Maunder Minimum, the Sporer Minimum, the Dalton Minimum to a lesser extent, the Wolf Minimum. But what you notice there's is a fingerprint of these grand solar minimums, and the same three things always occur. And they're like clockwork. When you have a grand solar minimum, you can guarantee that these three things will occur at the same time. You're going to have population migration because, like you've specified in Canada, if it gets too cold, they're not able to grow crops. There's too much of the economy affected. Uh, power grids go down during the winter. People are going to move. And we saw this even in Norway in the 1600s. Some of those cities in Norway emptied out 90%, 9-0. And then when people came back 70 years later, they found uh, towns that were 90% empty because the ports at that time were not able to bring supplies in that they were used to even during some of the winter months on the either side of the winter so nobody was able to survive. They couldn't really get food imports up there. We also see reduction in the economy, contraction. So I'm starting to see all around me the peripheral signs of an economic contraction coming. Because if your food is double or triple price, what are you going to stop spending on first? If your food costs double the amount of money, you're going to have to pull that money out of somewhere, something you would spend on. Movies, electronics, travel, whatever it is, that'll come back out of the economy focused in the food sector. Great for some. Great for some industries, but most things are going to contract on the sides. And then also we're going to see uh, significant crop losses, which we're starting to see now. And I, well, I kind of wanted to, you know, I heard you talking about melamine there, and I wanted to talk about China and the crop losses they're experiencing are as significant 
as the United States, or maybe even a little worse because they have the army worm uh, eating through the corn crop as well as the flood. So they're getting a, a double whammy, if you will. So the fingerprints of the grand solar minimum, economic contraction, population migration, uh, crop losses, and they kind of just feed on top of each other and kind of intertwine. This was in the past, you know, before we had all the electromagnetic crap and, you know, the CERN, you know, going on, you know, and screwing up the whole geomagnetic activity of the planet. That's even without all the new stuff that we have. So what do you think we're in for? Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns moving forward because the magnetic field on the Earth is declining in its strength. And that in turn allows more galactic cosmic rays in. It's the third time you heard me talk about galactic cosmic rays or cosmic rays. Heinrich Svensmark, he, you need to follow Heinrich Svensmark's work. Uh, there's a movie on YouTube called The Cloud Mystery. It's a free movie that you can watch, The Cloud Mystery. I, I encourage everybody to understand this, because if you understand the effect of cosmic rays on the cloud formation on the planet, you're going to understand why there's more rain happening. And if you can forecast into the future, the percentage increases in cosmic rays, we can see the percentage increases in the amount of massive you know, once in a century, once in a two century, once in a thousand year flood that are about to and have been uh, unfolding on the planet. But I tell you what, well, this is just the cusp of the beginning of the real changes. We're not anywhere close to where the heavy types of events will be. We're at the very still light events, if you will, compared to what's coming in about 2024, 25. What about the UV levels coming through? Because, you know, I've definitely noticed it. Like I said, I know I didn't used to be able to get a sunburn through my shirts at times. Do you know for sure, is there more actually UVB coming through and actually some UVC actually getting through the, our you know, upper atmosphere and coming down to us? Is, that, is this why the plants are burning on the tops a lot of times? Things like that, trees dying from the tops down? Now, this is coming from other people's research, so I'm not you know, coming with my own idea here. I'm just regurgitating somebody else's, but I'm synthesizing right. the data into kind of a point here to explain that. UVC, no, it's not reaching Earth level. UVC will kill you. If you get touched with UVC for even 10 or 15 minutes, you will die. It is not here on the planet of the Earth. It will not come to the surface of the Earth. You know, if the magnetic field on our planet decays and poles reverse, at that point we could see UVC striking the surface. In turn, about the plants being burnt, absolutely. If you feel that bite on your skin when you go outside, and I know when you go outside, when I was a kid, we go out and play all day and the sun was really soft and it was yellow and it was like a glorious... Feeling on your skin, yeah, it was really revitalizing. Remember those days? Well, now it's a biting. You know, every time you go out, it bites your skin. It's not even pleasant anymore to be under heavy sunlight because it bites. That's exactly what you're talking about with this total solar irradiance and the irradiance phase changes in the sun. And when I talk about the phase state, what I'm talking about, it's literally going into a different output of the radiation itself, the types of radiation you get this UVB increasing in intensity. We see some of our atmosphere collapsing and shrinking in slightly. This also will compress those cloud layers, and this is why we're starting to see more what they call rivers from the sky, or ring outs in the sky. There's just so many things happening at the moment, and what scares me is the mainstream media is not talking about it. They're trying to bury it. My whole premise is we need to talk about this because we need solutions moving forward as a global society. And they're trying to bury it and keep going. Global warming, all oh, the seas are going to rise. Uh, they haven't, they've risen at a steady rate. Awesome. There's more ice on Greenland. There's more ice in the Arctic. Uh, the winters are getting colder. The periphery seasons are extended to, to decrease our growing time. Yet nobody's talking about this. And that's really what scares me. What's on the horizon for floods and you know, events and food price rises, that's, that's unnerving. But what scares me is why the media is not talking about this and leading everybody at 100 miles an hour without an airbag straight into a brick wall without even talking about all these changes. Why aren't we working together already to try to solve some of the problems that we know occurred in the past? They're going to occur again. And we should have had these discussions for years already to get ready. And then what are we going to do about it? So what is our reality? Let's just go there. It, it's early in the, in the morning, but, hey, it might as well be late at night. Or, well, David, I don't know what time you're in. It doesn't even matter anymore. The uh, truth knows no time, man. Only now. Joseph, that exists now. Yeah. Joseph P. Farrell talked about the sacred geometry in a lot of, you know, religious buildings and stuff like that and how that they were used as a, well, kind of a transmitter. He postulated that, uh, well, at some point on on Earth, 
you know, and I hate to get all woo woo, but we got to kind of like look at history again. Uh, it said that it looks like that there was a more advanced civilization here before the ones that were told about, you know, the, the Indians, the, the Hindus, the, the Arabic, you know, going way past the, the Jews. We're well, just going back, right? And we lost everything. Something big happened, and our planet lost all of its tech. And Joseph P. Farrell kind of points to a organic radio transmitter, you know, uh, subject line for a big crash, and that could be where we are today, whereas you talk grand solar minimum, right? But then that's not the only thing that's going on, right? You're, you're, you're talking, talking about like the ley lines and the, and, the, and the nodal well, points, right, Steve? You know, I mean, I mean, have, no, have those been no, changed? No, no, I'm talking about the, the, no. the, the sacred geometry of temples and how the temples were designed um, with an altar in the middle where he said the priests would gather and they would cut open uh, an animal and yell at its guts and then that would take the resonant harmonics from the, the, the temple's priests, take it through the guts and then retransmit it at a higher frequency out the top of the temple. Right? He's like, oh, the, job, the, the mathematics proves that this is it. I'm like, oh, dude, I can't do your math. I, no, I don't know if that's true or not, but what if these little altar things, and they were sacrificing animals to use, you know, it's like an organic radio transmitter to talk from one place to the other. TrueLeafMarket.com, I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. There's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. Trueleafmarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. Because if we go through this thing and we're going through let's say, a grand solar minimum, right? That's one thing. So all of a sudden, the climate changes all around the entire world, different ways depending upon where you live. But the magnetic shift, the pole shift that you're talking about, David, is a separate thing. It might be related, may be unrelated, but we've been slowly shifting our polarity. And, you know, you're saying that they would drop off, but they're, they're non-similar, but it could cause incredible amounts of havoc on life on this planet. That's, I guess, what I'm thinking from there. And the entire civilization's ability to create widgets and doohickeys could be eliminated, pushing us back to a place where we need our chickens, right? You need everything. A solar panel is great for a minute until your batteries run out, and then it's just a stupid solar panel. And you got to figure out a way to make your own batteries. And, you know, it's a slippery slope when you're so embedded with technology. And I, I covered a lot of ground there. And I'm, I'm sorry, David, for going on the, that, that rant. But when you, when you take this argument to its fulfillment, what you potentially have is an end of the world as you know it scenario. How do you prepare for something like that? What are you thinking? You're not in the United States. Is that part of the reason you're not in the United States? No, but to answer the question, the first step is mentally preparing for it. Because without your mental preparation to be able to accept the swift changes, the constant state of change that's going to be associated with this event, you're not going to be able to make it pure and simple. It's about the mind first. Your body will follow, but your mind has to be there first to understand that we're coming into uncharted territory, although you, you touched on it. I do believe the ancients, the way they designed the temples, have left us messages through the past, through prehistory, that are pointing to times and showing us the cycles in the skies. You talked about Aquarius. What about the, 
procession of the equinoxes. I mean, they had mapped this out long before we even stumbled into this with our computers in the modern age. What was it about? Why was this iconography carved in stone that they knew thousands and thousands of years before we even knew what is happening in these in the procession? But how did they know that so long ago? So obviously they were leaving us messages transmitted down because if I wanted to leave you the same message and say, hey, we're going to come into this time and when you see these signals and these signs and these things happening, there's going to be a massive shift this direction. I, I couldn't really do it in English because it just wouldn't survive that long over 8, 10, 20, 50,000, 80,000 years. It wouldn't survive that long. So I have to bring it into myth and legend and religion and encode it in there. Like you talked about the Indian Vedic traditions. That's one of the oldest tradition systems on our planet. What's encoded there it hasn't changed a single, single, even one word, nor is the Torah, not even zero. It's been the exact same word since the inception of whatever traditions that you are. Uh, you know, the Bible's been translated so many times in so many different ways, but it's not like that in other traditions, especially when you get over into India and we get further back in time. Not a single word ever has been changed. So obviously they're trying to encode that knowledge and information for us to decipher it. When we had the tech again, they obviously knew we'd be able to decipher it again. So we're back to just like relooping and relooping. It's almost like you're in this program, relooping it again on the software. The manipulators, the ones who will and do want to control seem to always be the ones who gain the advantage of this technology and they conceal it and hide it from us while they get benefits from, if nothing else, the knowledge that it's there. Kind of like the free energy that yeah, we're, I'm, probably anyone listening here, you know, is pretty much assured that, hey, can we be 100%? No, but, you know, there's free energy out there. You know, there are ways. Tesla did it and, you know, it's pretty much proven other ways everyone that tries to do it, you know, dying at the most, you know, wonderful time of their life. You know, things like that. It's a uh, the manipulators you know if we lived on an altruistic planet uh, everything would be fuzzy bunnies but we don't unfortunately yeah that's true and if you know about magnetic motors and i encourage everybody to look up something called the perindev motor it's a magnetic motor basically when you were a kid and you used to play with magnets and you know you put them in your fingers and they would push each other apart well you're using the same principle just with higher powered magnets that are industrial magnets and it's called a perindev p-a-r-e-n-d-e-v Perindev motor, and you want to check that out, and I publicly state I will not test, I will not sell, I will not experiment or share my findings with anybody about the Perindev motor, but you need to take a look at that for yourself and see what you can accomplish with it. I, I played with John Bedini stuff, and you know, it's uh, pretty interesting. It's workable, isn't it? It actually really is doable. We're at this one point in mankind, if we want to go there, where they... The elites, let's just give that, we'll use that name for now. They're trying to shut everything down, right? They're shuffling people over from one place to another to create inner turmoil. They're inciting riots within the populations. They have an understanding of weather, but they're not telling us. They're telling us weather stories. They're trying to get off world. It's almost like they want to get away from here before something happens. Or maybe they're already away from here. You know, we don't know. NASA's been lying to us since its inception. And it continues to such an avail where you go, do, do I believe anything that you say? I, and I don't believe anything that they say until I can prove it. That's another here nor there. But what we do have is we are potentially sitting at a place where mankind can either, well, get it in your head, right, David? You got to fortify your brain and how you think. Thinking is the most important thing to get you through this. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. Go think about it, right? Are they going to win? Is mankind going to lose? Are we going to go into another age of darkness? Because all the chaos going to ensue in the next 10 years? I, mean, I don't know. But I know there are a lot of people listening to RBN that this isn't that strange of a conversation. We've had this conversation. It's usually relegated to late night. Woo! I don't know. I, I have this conversation here in my general life. But how do you prepare for that? You say preparing for it is a mental thing, right? So it's more like, well, yoga for the brain. Adaptability. Getting your, can you define that a little bit, David? I can, but you also have to think in terms of energy and vibration, and you hit on that. So the vibrational frequency of our sun is changing. And you're an electrical conduit as well. Your body is an electromagnetic receiver. 
So if our sun is changing in its electrical output and state, your body is going to change and morph those frequencies as well. And if I do want to go back in Indian Vedic tradition, because talk about the Kali Yuga, we've just come through the lowest possible human vibration, lowest frequency that is possible in the entire chart over the 12,500 years. We just passed through that in the last 300. We really, as a human civilization or vibrational frequency energy being, you can't go any lower than what we did in the last 300 years. That's it. But now every single day we're rising in vibrational frequency. Literally, the vibration and the energy is getting higher and higher and higher as we enter into the Dwapara Yuga. So as you ask, are these people going to win? No, they're absolutely not because they can't hold the vibration. That's why every system you're looking at across the planet right now, people are questioning it. They're no longer accepting it. They're saying, let's look at this. Let's look at it a different way. It doesn't seem to fit our age. And that's exactly what's happening. It doesn't fit our age anymore. Literally, vibrationally speaking, it doesn't fit our vibration age anymore. It doesn't. So when you say, hey, are these people going to win? No, they're not, because the vibration they're going to try to hold is being eroded daily. They're just going to disappear out of our actual visible frequency that we see them. They're going to have to wait again for 12,000 plus years before they can come back and get any power because every single day we get vibrationally more enhanced. We understand the workings of the universe. and We're also able to combat that type of negativity with our little, and I hate to be so woo-woo and so new world agey and talk about vibration, but that's where we are. Literally, the sun is changing its state and so is your body and your mind. Look at the world around you that's waking up. I like to go barefoot whenever when I can. You know, I, I, I loved it as a kid. It felt good, you know. I've noticed it doesn't feel quite as good. The Schumann resonance, you know, that we're all, you know, we're meant and, you know, born to vibrate with, you know, the, the what, you know, the peace and calm that keeps our body in, I guess, one piece and keeps us from flying off in all different directions. But um, I, Frank Allen has been talking recently about, you know, uh, someone else's data, I, that the Schumann resonance itself is being changed. You're talking about it coming from an, ex, you know, extraplanetary, you know, uh, source. Uh, could this also be, you know, not just the CERN, but isn't there one in China now that's even bigger than that? And who knows what else is across the planet in the jungles of South America or wherever? These things, every time they turn these huge things on, it's got to do something with magnetic flux and the frequency that our planet vibrates at. It, is this another reason why people are basically kind of dumb and on edge almost, lying, pillaging, raping, and just thinking it's normal? This video is brought to you by our friends at TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 